you're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. All right, everybody, welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. I'm Nikki Sims here, and I don't have Matt with me today. I don't have Andrew with me today. Kicked him off so that I could talk about the one thing that I can't shut up about lately, which is <laughs> jujitsu. <laughs> and I was able to bring on a guest who I'm really, really excited about. His human name is Nick Albin, but he is way more commonly known as Jiu-Jitsu or Chewy. And he is a jujitsu information superstar. So welcome. <laughs> hey, how are you? Yay. So one thing that I love about Chewy, I mean, he's a competitive black belt jujitsu -er. What's the common way to say that? I think that typically you'll see jujitsu practitioner, jujitsu okay. players, another one that gets used. And then in Brazil, it'd be like jujitero, jujitera, you know, that sort of thing. But okay. I usually use practitioner or sometimes player because like in judo, they say judo player. Oh, okay, awesome. So you're a black belt jujitsu practitioner and you still compete as a black belt. Yeah, yeah, I still compete a bit. I don't compete as much as I did when I was younger, but I still compete a bit. Yeah, that's a high level. When you're a competitive black belt, it's just like you go places. <laughs> well, and you just have to like, I don't know, for me, it's something where when I compete, I get so wrapped up in it yeah. that it consumes so much of my energy and my thoughts that I feel like I can't do a whole lot else. Whereas, you know, when just training regularly, it's more fun. And so I'll compete sometimes at like at a big competition. Like I don't have the situation that like younger people have, like when they're newer, where they have so much mat rust. Like if they don't compete regularly, they kind of like get out of the flow of stuff. Whereas me, I've been competing and grappling since I was 15 years old. It doesn't do the same thing that it used to when I was younger. We were like into some crazy mental state. And so I tend to compete at some of the bigger tournaments that I want to do from time to time. And, and I'm also not really worried about like hitting some like I'm number one in the world at this yeah. thing because I accumulated this many points. I'm like, I'm sort of yep. beyond that point. I'm just like, I compete when I want to for fun. Yep. That's a fun way to do it. And you know, you run a gym mm -hmm. and a YouTube channel and an Instagram mm -hmm. channel, which that's how I first knew about you. My first professor sent me one of your videos. So I think you were actually the first jujitsu YouTube I ever watched. Oh, wow. Cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad he sent the video because, you yeah. know, sometimes there's a, <laughs> sometimes I'll, I'll hear from people online. They'll say, hey, you know, I, I watch your videos. My coach tells me never to watch YouTube, but I watch yours anyway, that kind of stuff. So I'm glad <laughs> that he was like, hey, check this video out. It's good. Yeah, it was really useful. <laughs> <laughs> and that's actually one of the things I like about Chewy is if you ever have a question about jujitsu, you can send it to him and he'll answer it. And that just shows me that you've thought very deeply about the sport and it's very important to you to know how to teach it. I find a lot of respect for that as a coach, someone who goes to that level, being able to communicate it to anybody, no matter their level. And it's not about you, the teacher, it's about them getting the information. So love that about all of your info. So thanks. <laughs> you're welcome. Well, you as a coach, you understand that, right? Like, yeah. you know, your job as a coach is to break down information and share it to someone in a way that they're able to take it and get something from it, right? And a lot of times as coaches, we can become so disconnected, especially if we've been doing what we've been doing for a long time, we can be disconnected from the stuff that people actually deal with in their early phases, you know, and, you know, it just happens where, you know, we could look at the question and say, this seems so simple to me. Of course, this isn't a problem or of course, it's this whatever. But the person that's in that space that's new to something, they don't feel that way yeah. to them. It's a big deal. And so it's important to like, you know, when you think about it, like to address that person wherever they're at and to help them out through the problem, even if it seems like something so rudimentary, right? Right. Yeah, some of the very basic things like a hip escape, like my first jujitsu class was like, hey, we're gonna do hip escapes. And everyone's just like rolling about on the floor, yeah, looking yeah. like their pants are gonna fall off. And I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> also, why right. didn't anyone tell me to wear pants underneath my gi pants? <laughs> mm -hmm. I appreciate that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> also, everybody, Chewy is a big advocate of being strong for mm -hmm. jujitsu, so much so that he has strength programs that he's made for people who do jujitsu. Is it your gym business partner, Joe? My gym business partner, Joe, is the one that we have one program up right now. I'm working on a second one that I use primarily right now, but he was the one that wrote that one, that particular program. And we basically took a bunch of our jujitsu practitioners in the gym through the program 
because many of them had wanted to lift. They'd never lifted before. They didn't understand the basics. They've never followed a program before. And so we put them on a program. And it's been interesting because, you know, first off, everybody got stronger, which was good. And then a lot of injuries decreased. We noticed that with people. Some of my most injury prone students were all of a sudden not getting injured. And then a lot of them found a love for lifting afterwards. So they've continued to do it afterwards. But yeah, my business partner, Joe, helped me out with that one. Rad. So you have an interesting way of gauging that. Like you can tell that people got stronger because, you know, their 5RMs, their PRs went up. Mm -hmm. But did you roll with some of them before they started strength training and then during and after? So you could Mm -hmm. feel it on yourself too. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Well, you can feel like when certain people have more power in certain positions or more strength when they go for something, you know, anytime you roll with someone enough, you can definitely tell when, if their weight is increasing in a certain way, or if their weight's decreasing, or if they're becoming faster or slower, whatever, when you roll with people enough, you get that sixth sense about it. Very much like if you're lifting, you can tell if you're off on a day, you can just feel it. Or you can feel when you're on, you know, regardless of what programming you're supposed to do that day, you know, we've all done it before. You're like, you know, it says to stop here, but then you're like, man, I feel really good today. Right. Let me <laughs> see if I can do a little bit more today, yeah. you know? And so you can notice those things. So yeah, you, there was definitely a difference when a lot of them started lifting weights, both in their physical body composition and then also the actual way they felt on the mats when you would grab a hold of them, things like that. Are there certain movements or positions that If you know that other person is stronger than you, you just like don't want to mess with. (laughs) You mean like if they're strong in a particular movement, it sort of holds a little bit more weight. Yeah. So probably, you know, if like we're on the feet doing takedowns, if the person has decent wrestling ability, if I know that they have a really like a strong squat and a deadlift, that means that they're going to have a lot of leg strength and a lot of hip strength. That would be for me like, okay, this person's going to be strong. I need to be mindful of that. You know, like I really could care less about a bench press so much, but like the big strong leg and hip muscles, those come into handy even on the ground where, you know, if you're getting ready to do a sweep of some sort and you've got to generate some hip strength or an arm bar and you have to generate some hip strength, those muscles are far more important than again, just being strong with, uh, I know there's nothing wrong with a bench press and a bicep curl, but you know, they're not necessarily useful for those. So, or as threatening to me. I'm more worried about a person that has like really strong back, yeah. legs, and those muscles and hips more so than say that just the pushing muscles. Yeah. You can do big things with the legs and the hips. It mm-hmm. can be very scary. <laughs> so what do you find to be really useful when you tell someone to start strength training? What kind of exercises? It depends on the person, right? Because I mean, we're all so different, but there's some similarities. I'm not that big in like doing anything too crazy, especially for the beginners. So if like someone's getting into it, it's like the basics are the basics and they're good. They work for everyone regardless. Like I think sometimes beginners come in and they have a proclivity to sometimes watch, say really high level athletes do very sports specific training and they look at it and they go, okay, I want to do that. Like, it's like, well, okay, well, wait a second. Like this person has been training for a long time and they're doing this specifically for them. We don't need you to replicate that stuff. We need you to do just some basics. You need to get your whole body strong. Yes. So let's start with some squats, some deadlifts, some bench press. And if we have to modify some of those exercises because of injuries, sure, we can do that. Another thing is with the auxiliary lifts, focusing on doing the opposite of what we do a little bit. Hmm. Um, So for instance, in jujitsu, if we're talking about a jujitsu athlete that gets into strength training, we'll typically put some specific focus on hip extension and upper back work to open up the chest. Because a lot of times we have this rounded back posture. Our hips are constantly in flexion, right? And so if you ever look at a jiu-jitsu guy's posture, a jiu-jitsu woman's posture that doesn't lift very much, it can get really, really bad where they have constant rounding in the back and slumped posture. And then if you look at their hips, their hips are muted. Oh man. Where their hips never fully extend open. And so those are a problem. You'll look at them and you'll see it sometimes. Like you'll see a jiu-jitsu athlete and they have no butt right? Because it's like their butt's just sort of tucked under. (laughs) And so along with like the basics, if they're a jujitsu practitioner getting into it, we'll focus on those areas. All right, we need to do some upper back where we got to open up that spine and get your chest up. Probably do a little bit of stretching in the pec and the bicep as well. And then we've got to do some hip extensions of some sort, whether that's through deadlifts and squats, but also even doing things like hip thrusts and stuff like that, where you can really get strong in those particular movements along with loosening up the hip flexor. Because a lot of people in jiu-jitsu have terrible back issues and stuff like that. And typically they want to stretch their back, but in reality, usually it's a strength issue where they've got really weak hip extension and the hip flexors are overpowering. And so it's creating this imbalance that then messes with the back a lot. So, you know, 
traditionally for a beginner, basic programming, you know, it's basic stuff where you get them in doing all the fundamental lifts and then maybe give them a little specific focus to those particular areas. Cause those tend to be some of the ones that seems to be culprit for injuries for jujitsu practitioners. At least I've noticed from both my experience as a person and also from the people I train with. When did you start lifting a lot? I started lifting when I was in like seventh grade. So I got jumped as a kid and got beat up. And I remember like just wasn't in a good place. And I remember my buddy's dad had a regular just weightlifting set down in the basement of his house. And we would go down there and he would take me and his son down there. We'd lift weights. And I don't know what it was about it, but it was like, it felt good to like lift weights and get stronger. And, you know, as a kid, you watch TV and you see these images of like guys, like, you know, for me, I grew up watching Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, you know, and John Claude Van Damme and all these dudes from the eighties. and Also the Ninja Turtles. Those guys are super jacked. (laughs) Yeah, they're all jacked. They're all jacked. Ninja Turtles, they were all jacked right so i was like okay uh, gi joe's like oh, yeah. um, i was actually looking at a video it was talking about the evolution of say like action figures with kids Ooh. and you know back in the 50s it was very like the body wasn't anything crazy you know he was just like this normal shaped man and then by the 90s you could even see serratus muscles you know which <laughs> if you can see the serratus muscle you've got pretty low body fat percentage yes and so the serratus muscles coming through and you're like <laughs> you're like so as a kid you're growing up playing with these guys i'm like i want to look like this and so it felt good to be kind of doing that. And I remember even just right out of the gate, I enjoyed the delayed soreness, you know, which I don't know what that says about me. I liked it. I was like, oh, that feels good. Yeah. And then I remember I just kind of was hooked from that point. And so from that point on, I just enjoyed lifting weights and have always been into it forever. It's, it's always kind of like um, been kind of a constant in my life, even before jujitsu. Mm-hmm. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know it was before jujitsu. Yeah. I started wrestling in high school when I was 14. Okay. And then I started doing jujitsu when I was 18. And so lifting was like my first love, right? Yeah. That was my first physical love. So I loved lifting. Like I actually, I remember my 13th birthday, I remember I had saved up cutting grass, raking leaves, all that stuff. And I bought, they used to have these things. I don't know if this is still a thing, but they used to have this thing in the supermarket called a thrifty nickel. And it was basically like a classified ad and you could put it in there or whatever, and you could get weights. And I remember I originally, one of my family members had given me one of those sets of like standard concrete weights, like the plastic with the concrete and they (laughs) sucked. I mean, it was like, you know, it's like they didn't weigh anything and I didn't like it. And so I eventually got in the thrifty nickel and found a bench that then had the little set so you could squat on it and then like where you could extend it. And then it was a standard Olympic size thing. And so my room was down in the basement at the time. And so I had my bed, my computer, my little like living area. (laughs) And then right next to it was my weight set. You know, so I I, I saved up a bunch of money. And on my 13th birthday, I went out and like bought it because, you know, we were kind of poor at the time. So I had to save up to buy it, you know, Yeah. but I got it and started just lifting at home all the time. And you've done that forever. <laughs> yeah, Your basement yeah. is just bigger now. <laughs> yeah, well, now because I'm close enough to, I have a gym. So like, you know, now I own a gym. And so we've got everything in there. In fact, we've pretty much got any piece of equipment that I can possibly want. The only thing I really want to get is I want to get like one more leg machine of mm. some sort, like either like maybe a press or a hack squat, just something to mess around with as an auxiliary, you know, because we have platforms, we have weights for squats, we have cable machines and all that stuff. I have a belt squat machine, which is amazing. Oh, those are oh. Love that. Yeah, so it's yeah. like if I could just get that one more piece of machinery just to like tax the legs a little bit more in yeah. a different way, then I'll be set and that's it. So Oh, that's a dream gym. Yeah. It's pretty dang good. When your list of oh, just one one more little thing when you hit that level, like <laughs> that's pretty dang good. <laughs> Well, and I say that just one more, but I'm sure like at some point There's I'm going to say, like, you know, more. just one more, you know, <laughs> it's a problem. Rogue will invent something that we didn't know we needed. <laughs> oh, I know. God bless. They've gotten some money from us for sure, yeah. but at least they make good equipment so you can't hate it. I noticed like when a lot of people get started with jujitsu and especially people in their 20s, they get started and then they want to do all the things like they want to do Muay Thai, they want to do yoga, they want to lift, they want to work on their conditioning. And I know when you're our age, <laughs> masters athletes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. that's not entirely an option to do all the things. But like, what do you think are the most, if someone wants to supplement their jujitsu practice, what are the most important things to do and not do? I guess it depends. It's always different, right? So I think that there is some value in doing things like Muay Thai and kickboxing and boxing for self-defense purposes and fighting purposes. I boxed for a long time as well. I got into jujitsu because I wanted to fight. And so I used to box and used to kickbox. I did it pretty consistently for six, seven years when I was fighting. So three, four times a week for six, seven years. 
but you know, it may not be everybody's thing, but I think it's good to do it. And then as far as like jujitsu goes, like if you're talking about jujitsu and supplementary stuff, I think that, you know, you do your jujitsu training. And then to me, it's like, once you get into it, you need to give it a little bit of time before you add something else on the plate. So this is kind of, for me, this is the way I always think about stuff because we understand that we have to be consistent at something initially to get good at it, right? With anything you do, it's all about consistency. It has yep. nothing to do with like, you can have all the short-term intensity you want to, but it's about consistency first. But there's this thing that happens once you do something consistently long enough, it becomes easier to do. If you become more efficient at it, you become more effective and it typically takes less of a toll on you. So for instance, like the first time you get a lifting program and it's got a bunch of lifts that you're not familiar with, you got to look them up and, and okay, what is this thing? Okay, right. where's that machine in this gym or whatever? That learning curve. Exactly. But then once you do the program over and over again, you know, then it becomes simple. You just know what you're doing. And so it becomes easier, faster, and more efficient. Jiu-Jitsu is no different where you go into it initially and it really beats you up. It makes you sore in places you've never been sore in, especially like in going back to the hips. You get really sore in weird places in the hips. At least I was when I first started. Oof, can confirm. But then eventually it gets to the point where the plate's spinning, so to speak. So that plate's spinning. Now we got it going. Let's get another one going. So once it's at that point, then you can say, okay, what else do we want to add on to it? I think if I had to pick one, this is just me. I think strength training would be a valuable like option first. Because I think that a lot of times, for instance, with people, they'll talk about tightness in their body. And sometimes tightness is actually the muscle being shortened or whatever they're being toned in the muscle. But a lot of times the muscle tightness can come from muscle imbalances. Yeah. So for instance, people will say, man, I've got really tight legs. One of the things I used to have, I used to have terrible squat depth. And it was because I always used to have tight legs is what I would say. The squat depth, I would stretch my face off and sometimes it was okay. But what I found that actually worked out better was just taking, putting less weight on the bar and doing really slow reps. Like I would do like a five second eccentric down one, two, three, four. And then wherever I landed, I would do a pause and then come back up. Nice. And the reps were brutal. But what I noticed was my body got strength in the whole range of motion rather than just squatting and bouncing out of it. Right. And I noticed that as I did that, my legs actually felt stronger. They actually got a little bit bigger and the mobility in my hips and everything else was much improved. Um, I noticed that on the mats, like I had better range of motion, not from stretching, but from lifting because I was focused on the range of motion. Yeah, that's a crazy thing for people to actually believe can happen. Well, because it goes opposed to what we've been mostly taught, right? Because we've been taught this notion that if you lift, that somehow you're going to get really tight and yeah. you're gonna, your muscles are going to get too tight, right? Muscle bound. Yeah, exactly, which could happen. But if you work on full range of motion, right. instead of simply just, okay, like, you know, I'm doing this isolated thing where I'm just like a, like, yeah. you'll see guys do that. Like a lot of times what happens, especially with us guys, is we become these meatheads who get too focused on our egos. We go into the gym, everybody's seen the bro squat, right? You, you load the bar up with more plates than they could possibly handle. Mm -hmm. And their squat like is a fifth of the way down. They basically just kind of like bend a little bit and then yeah. they pop it back it's up. A shallow knee bend. Right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, you know that, but then if you like let the weight sort of push you down and really focus on getting that range of motion, when you get into it, it can be a beautiful thing for developing strength in the whole range of motions. Cause if you have say a, a situation with your quads, your, you know, hamstrings being imbalanced, if those things get strengthened up properly, they don't have as much trouble. So I actually felt pretty good with that. And, you know, if you look at the literature that exists, proper strength training is one of the best things you can do for injury prevention. Yeah. And again, one of the problems with jujitsu is it, it can chew up your body and it can mess things up. And so I think it's a really beneficial thing for fighting injuries because people like myself, I've had relatively few injuries over my years of training. And a lot of the people that I know that train consistently and lift consistently will be able to say the same thing. And then afterwards, you can add the yoga in, which I think yoga can be really good if you've got those things in place. And, you know, you can start to learn how to like, I think some of the benefits from yoga are being able to breathe in the movements and then the stretching and stuff's nice, but the breathing can be really important yeah. because again, there's another factor to people that will say I'm tight. That has nothing to do with necessarily the actual muscle, but it can be a neurological right? Like, yeah, you're tense, yeah. right? So you could have muscle tone that's created from your rigidity and from your being over anxious because you're not breathing properly. A lot of people, if you watch them breathe, this is something for people that are listening, maybe, you know, talking about breathing sounds funny, but you'll watch a lot of people, they don't actually breathe into their stomachs. They breathe up in their chest. And so you'll watch their chest. Like, yeah, right at the top. Which is okay when you're in the middle of a really hard training session or something, it's okay. But when you're offloading that CO2, but 
you know, day to day, your breath should be coming into your stomach, into your diaphragm, and should be expanding. And if you look at the literature and the way that it affects the vagus nerve, those two things can create a completely different situation in the body. If you're breathing <sighs> shallow and up in the chest, that can basically create more um, sympathetic tone. Yeah, it's like a panic right? response. And, right. Yeah. And then if you breathe in through your nostrils and into your diaphragm with a slower breath, it has a more parasympathetic rest and digest. And so just those two things, if you focus on it, it seems so stupid, but if you learn how to manipulate your breath, I mean, this is why you can go watch the Wim Hof breathing stuff. Or if you look at the, some of the people yes. that are out talking about breath work, it's really interesting about what you can do with your body, whether you want to be more charged up and ready to do something, or if you want to bring it down, like before competition, I'll do some breath work to get my body charged up to get out there and get ready to do something. And it makes a big difference. So there's a lot of components going on when, People talk about like lifting weights, injury prevention, and everything else. But to sort of bring this long-winded answer to a simple question back to the start, I would say start with jujitsu, obviously, that when you want to begin doing another thing, if you're focused on jujitsu primarily, start with the weightlifting after you get that kind of going a few times a week, whatever. Mm -hmm. It feels very efficient. Then you can add a little bit of yoga yeah. from time to time when it's available. Yeah. Clearly, I agree with that answer. <laughs> sure. Being a strength coach. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I found that will have a role. I remember this happening a lot as a white belt. It's just like you just kind of get creamed and you're just like, oh, I need to go fix on all the things. But you're so right that just showing up and learning and practicing is what you need to be doing. And then mm -hmm. another consideration is people only have so much time in the day. Yeah. You know, you have to work, you have to do your jujitsu, you have to take care of your family, everything else. And so to fit another component into your training can be a big ask and lifting it has a huge effect on the mats, but also for like all of the other physical attributes, but you don't have to do it, you know, five days a week, you can get a lot done in three days a week for it to make a tremendous improvement across the board. Absolutely. And then when you're adding something new into the mix, I think we've all experienced this. Sometimes what you have to do is you have to sort of let go a little bit of something else mm -hmm. for just a little bit yeah. while you're getting it going, right? Because it's like, you know, we get so stuck in our rhythms and our patterns. And so then when we throw something new, it frustrates us because we're not doing our normal pattern and rhythm, but it's usually temporary, right? So for instance, if you're doing jujitsu and you're going like four or five days a week, you're like, okay, I'm hitting every day a week, whatever it is. Well, if you get into lifting and you're brand new to lifting, it's probably going to tax you more than what you're expecting or more than what you may expect. And then, so you might need to take a rest day or do a day where you come in and drill and do technique and no rolling. And then once you get used to the lifting, then you can go back to your, maybe a higher frequency of jujitsu, but there may be a time where the frequency comes down a little bit to sort of make room for this thing you're trying to add to the mix. Yes. You know, and so you have to kind of make room for it because if you try to like stubbornly stick to a schedule just because arbitrarily it's the thing you've been doing for a while and then you're adding something new and then you're incredibly sore from lifting and then you try to go into the hardcore rolling sessions and then you're getting beat up more there and you're never yeah. giving yourself the time to recover to this new activity that's shocking your system it's probably not going to be a good thing. So sometimes it's good to kind of like, as one thing's sort of like in place, when you're building up something new to let the thing come down just a little bit. And then once again, it becomes efficient, then you can kind of increase the frequency of the other thing if you decide to go back to that. I like that. Yeah, you have to be okay with letting something else take the priority for just a minute. Mm -hmm. You're not giving anything up. Yeah. Like a little bit less is actually more in the long run, it seems like. <laughs> right. Well, because like I've had experiences with jujitsu practitioners getting into lifting and I've had the experience with lifters getting into jujitsu. And it's funny because the same thing happens, right? The jujitsu practitioner who's training a lot will get into lifting. And then when you say, hey, because he's sore or whatever, why don't you just take a day off and let your body rest and come back tomorrow? And they're afraid of getting worse or losing progress, right? I mean, it's the same thing for the lifter. The lifter is coming into jujitsu and, you know, they don't want to let their numbers go because they become attached to, I hit this PR. And so right. I can't possibly ever let it go down lower than that because I hit that, you know, even though it's going to happen, Yep. <laughs> you know, whether eventually you get really old and it just comes down anyway, but you know, that kind of thing, like, you, you know, we get so attached to things, right? Like Absolutely. once our ego gets wrapped around like, you know, I'm this or I'm that. Uh, you're so right about that. It's yeah. been this struggle to like, well, just you don't always have to be that. We can make room depending on where you want to go in your life and you can change a little bit. Just white knuckling our way through our egos. <laughs> yeah, right. That's so true. I've done it. Oh, absolutely. Me too. Well, you know, we've all done it. So <laughs> I feel okay laughing at myself about it. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, biggest question. I was even talking about it this morning with two of the guys that I roll with about jujitsu specific 
strength training, which I know we both have a lot of opinions on. But when I think of that, I think of people doing exercises in the gym that look like jujitsu. Mm -hmm. And what are your thoughts? <laughs> so I got a fun story. So years ago, there was like a magazine that came out. It was like a really old jujitsu magazine way back in the day. And this is like 2004 you know, maybe 2005, sometime in run then. And it had the arm bar workout is what this thing was called, right? Oh my God, yes. Yeah, right? So <laughs> I was like, okay. So like now me, I had never really been into that stuff. But my coach at the time was like, yeah, dude, do this workout with me. And he wasn't really into lifting, you know, because me, I just like lifting. I like lifting, yeah. doing the normal stuff, right? But he was like, no, man, we got to do this arm bar workouts for what we do. I'm like, oh, okay, I'll try it. So we do this workout. And I mean, it's like we would take like, for instance, one of the exercises was the cable machine where you can adjust the pulley up and down to, to do the curls or tricep press downs, whatever, or, or flies. We pulled this thing to the very bottom. Okay. And then so basically my arm is extended. I'm laying on my back. I've got the hand gripping the hand and I'm basically doing a curl as if you're getting arm bars. I'm basically laying on my back and I'm doing a curl. And this, I guess, was somehow like my arm is going to get stronger at defending the arm bar, <laughs> even though <laughs> this is not how you defend an arm bar, right? Like best way to defend an arm bar is not get another arm right. bar. Right. <laughs> or like try to like, like, like you could do a hitchhiker escape or something, but like, I'm sure, I'm pretty sure in this, I've never ever seen a coach say, all right, guys, we're going to work on arm bar escapes. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to curl the person back, you know? And usually the only time you can do that is if you're like, I, I would do that kind of stuff with my little kids class. Right. They'd get me in an arm bar and I would like Hulk Hogan it, like yes. I'd shake it out or whatever, and bring it back. <laughs> You know, but it's, it's the most ridiculous thing ever. I'm like, what is this? So anyway. Oh my gosh. How many biceps were torn from this arm bar program? I God wonder. knows. <laughs> well, see, and that's where it goes to. So I did this workout and it was just giant sets on top of sets on the biceps yeah. and the arms and everything else. And so I remember I had a sort of a lifting mentor. His name was Jim and J-I-M owned a G-Y-M. Perfect. It was his destiny. <laughs> yeah, right. He was meant to do it. And he was a cool dude. He lifted like he was a heavy lifter. He had done some bodybuilding. He'd done some strong man like around town and stuff like that. Like they had this really cool picture of him. He had this fridge that was packed with like hundreds of pounds of weights. And he would like was walking it around, you know, some of that old stuff <laughs> back in the 70s. But he was so funny because he was an old dude who was like, God, he was like in his like late 60s or something. And he could still, like he would do like a seated behind the neck press with 255. He could bang out reps with 315. I mean, he was a, still a strong fella. Good gracious. It's a tank. Yeah. And so one day I come in there and I'm like working out and I'm like holding my arms. I'm like, God, my arms are so sore. And uh, he looks at me and he used to call me Nikki. He's like, <laughs> Nikki, what's wrong with your arms? And I was like, tell him about this workout. And he asked me, he said, aren't you doing a lot of this already in that jujitsu stuff you're doing? And I'm like, yeah, he goes, so why do you need to do more of it in the gym? You know? And I was like, damn, like, and like looking back at it now, such like common sense advice, right? You know, this is where I think about like a lot of the functional stuff. I'm not saying that some of it doesn't have a place because there can be, but I think that when you do the same thing over and over again, like you get pattern overload mm. where basically the same patterns that are causing the muscular imbalances that you have in the gym, like it's only being furthered more so. And I think the negative part about that is, is if we're lifting, one of the things that to me, just lifting is for longevity, say, at least for me, yeah. it's about, I want to be strong. I want to look good with my clothes off and I want to be able to function as I get older. Because, you know, when you look at the reasons people go into nursing homes, because they can't take a squat and they're frail and weak. They, yeah. And they can't sit down on the toilet. Right. I remember an old man, he's a friend of our families. We call Mr. E. Mr. E is somewhere in his upper nineties. And I remember he was telling me, He's like, yeah, back when I was in my 70s, you know, like, 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 I'm wow. talking about shit. <laughs> I know, right? My 70s, but it was in my 70s. That's yeah, in my know. 70s. Back in my 70s, you know, I was starting to get kind of weak and they were talking about putting me on a nursing home. So he said, to hell with that shit. And so he said he started doing squats, oh and, you know, God, just like awesome. little squat exercises and keeping his legs strong and he would go on walks. And he said that that kind of kept him from, you know, having to go in the nursing home. Mr. E knows what's up. <laughs> <laughs> right. So basic stuff. So, you know, with those two kind of stories, I just think uh, I'm not a big fan of trying to replicate everything that we do in the gym. I think if you develop strong overall power in your body, strength in your body, holistically from top to bottom, I think that you can then get into your sport and translate it. Now, I'm not going to say that there's never a time to do sport specific training in some capacity because there could be. But I think that especially for most people, 
you know, I just don't think it's necessary. And especially when you're talking about like people just getting into weight training, I think it's absolutely not necessary because I think you need to be focused more on a well-rounded approach first. Yeah. You said at the beginning of the show, you have to get your whole body strong. Yeah. So then if you decide that, you know, after lifting for some years, you decide you want to like take a certain area and mimic something. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Go ahead and do it. But I think that's more of like the, you know, it's kind of like, you know, if you were talking about the food pyramid, right? Like the fundamental lifts, you got your fundamental ones and your accessories, whatever. That kind of stuff to me is at the top of the pyramid. It's the least amount. Totally. It should not take up the whole chunk. Yeah. It's getting your whole body strong means that you're training a ton of musculature, which carries over to a large systemic improvement. Mm -hmm. And you can't skip that step to reap the benefits of the accessory movements. Like if you don't have a strong back from deadlifts and squats, like doing single arm cable rows that look a lot like you're trying to leg drag or something is just not going to be an impact. And, mm -hmm. you know, and you're only going to be able to do that with like 30 pounds versus if you get really strong, you're going to be able to do that right. kind of stuff with like hundreds of pounds. <laughs> yeah. And if you want to do arm drags or leg drags, go do it and grab a partner on open mat or whatever and do some reps. Yeah. You know, get your reps in. I think getting reps in can be a great thing. Just, I think when you go to the weight room, again, it's, not to further mimic what you're already doing. It's to just build this machine that you've been gifted to like build this thing up and keep it strong. And like you said, you can recruit way more muscles and develop much more musculature and strength by using exercises in a way where you can recruit more muscles and get really strong. And again, that will have a transferable effect, especially if you're training while you're getting stronger. You know, your body will learn to recruit that strength and that muscles that you now have into those exercises and movements that you've been using. Yeah, like how you said that it's a machine, like you can strengthen the machine from the lifts. Like we know that lifting translates into strength. That is the one thing that you do to get stronger. You don't get stronger by doing jujitsu. You don't get stronger by running. Mm -hmm. You get stronger by lifting. So strengthen the machine, then bring the machine into those different kind of environments where the machine can be utilized to a further capacity. Right. I mean, if you go into yoga, you're not going to say, hey, ma'am, um, can I just do the yoga that I need to do for jujitsu? Yeah. You know, like you're not. You're going to try to get the whole body, you know, in line and everything else. And if you get some flexibility, you'd like it to be flexible around the whole system. Because when you think about jujitsu, jujitsu is movement. So if you move better, like I have people that will come in from gymnastics and like things like that, where they have such good control of their bodies. And those people like it's amazing what they can do early on just from from the gymnastics. I have some people that have been yogis and again, they're very flexible and limber. And again, they're able to utilize their flexibility. They have this sort of latent and flexibility there in their body that then you can say, well, hey, here's an armbar. Hmm, how can I figure out how to use this flexibility for this purpose? And so that if you're strong, well, then you're saying, okay, well, let me learn the technique and how can I apply a little strength to this situation? So you're basically, you know, the attributes that you're developing can find their way into your jujitsu. So it's better to focus on those attributes like strength and power and flexibility and all this stuff there. And then when you roll and you do your technique and you're doing your drilling, then you kind of figure out, well, how can you sort of interweave those together and find a purpose for them later on mm -hmm. rather than just, you know, doing them outside of the gym. So what do you think would be some good accessory like someone squatting, benching, deadlifting, what do you think are good accessory or supplemental exercises that actually might have a reasonable carryover if there are any? I like, so for instance, like the hips, I really like hip thrusts, yep. you know, like where basically you're putting the barbell across the pad on your hips and, you know, you see all the ladies doing them to get their butts bigger. Absolutely. <laughs> I live in the OC. I can't leave the house without seeing it. <laughs> and I'm okay with that, yeah. right? Great, I'm also great. Uh, team butt. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, I think it's been like for women, I feel like the trend is much better. Like I remember growing up as a kid in like the nineties and late nineties and it was like, everybody was real thin. The thigh gap. And then now it's like women are getting stronger and they're getting like, you know, more muscular. I'm like, yeah, this is a great trend. I <laughs> yep. like this. Like, I'm happy to be alive during this era. <laughs> yeah. It's like, you're actually healthy. You know, yeah. that's good. The hip thrusts are great, you know, because you're getting, you're, you're furthering that hip extension, which again, in jujitsu, we really don't get a lot. We use it sometimes. Yeah. But if you look at the positions that we're in, almost always our knees, if we're on our back or up on our chest, yep. you know, and so then we'll need this powerful hip extension for like an arm bar or for a shot or a takedown. But otherwise we don't do it. We stay in this sort of curled up rounded back position. I think that like upper back work where we're basically focusing on like, um, you can think of like reverse, what do they call them? Reverse fly and stuff like this oh, where we're sure. pulling across basically to strengthen the upper back muscles essentially we're always doing this yeah. so being focused on opening up the chest 
and then even doing things like I'm even a fan of like RDLs. Yeah. I think RDLs can be good. I think that one, if you do the RDL and really focus one on keeping your back really tight in the position, like, as you'll see, sometimes people like load up the RDL and they just kind of like their back starts to break. So focusing on really keeping that back tight. Lots of extension. Lots of extension. And then it also, I've noticed that it helps some, um, at least it helped me. I used to have some really tidal hamstrings. And then, so you're getting this eccentric stretch as you're going down. I felt a lot better. So I used to, when I was getting used to squatting better, where I could get my legs to actually get myself down to a proper depth, I would start my workouts with really light RDLs as I would get almost like a weighted stretch in my hamstrings before I would get into it. But I also noticed that if I got better at locking in my back in the position, I noticed that I can maintain that posture. Like say, if I'm sitting inside guard and I've got to really keep my posture up, the exercises like deadlifts, RDLs, any of that stuff, even row work. Absolutely. Where you're focusing on not just like yanking the weight around, but really focus on like locking your back in place and then pulling the muscles back, like the arms back. That kind of stuff's super important. And then like rows and everything else is important. I think it's important to do pressing exercises as well. Yeah. You know, they all have their purpose. You know, even basic arm work, you know, again, you don't have to go crazy on it, but a lot of times people we end up doing a lot of pulling, a lot of tight pulling. So even doing some tricep work can be useful just for balancing out the arms so you don't get a lot of tendonitis. Yeah. You know, it is what it is. But as far as like, depending on the person, you can get all over the place. But like I said, he typically goes back into those areas where I think about what we do a lot is our background. So we've got to do upper back work. And when we do our back rope work, our, our pulling and our rows to be very mindful of the locking of the back so it stays in position. So you can develop those muscles to support good posture. Things with evolving hip extension and all that stuff and strengthening the posterior chains good. Yeah. Because those are muscles that don't get a lot of work in jujitsu. And if again, if you want to support the low back, those are important muscles to strengthen, which we need. And then, you know, again, because we do so much pulling, I think it's useful to do some pushing exercises to sort of balance out the arms because another area that a lot of people will complain is their elbows get really tight yeah. or start to hurt because they're constantly squeezing and then pulling in. Yeah. I like that you touched on the full range of motion exercises too. I Googled like just to see what the internet says, like strength work for jujitsu. And it was a lot of short range of motion things like floor presses and stuff that you're actually not taking the joint through the full range of motion. And mm -hmm. it's stuff like that that actually does start to nag on joints a bit more. Yeah. But moving through it doesn't always have to be like ass to grass squats or anything. Yeah. But you do need to incorporate a large range of motion. So you're not just giving yourself tendonitis in another room. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I think floor presses are great and you could throw them in the program from time to time for sure. But a floor press is like something that would go after doing like, you know, your pr predominant chest exercises and yeah, stuff. Yeah, it's a bench accessory. Yeah, you know, and so you can do it sometimes. It'll strengthen up the tricep, you know, but even, even if you're just like a regular gym bro and you're just lifting weights and stuff like that, let's say for instance, even people that are just trying to lift weights to get stronger, if you just want to look better with your clothes off in some cases, right? You'll recruit more muscle if you're letting those muscles like get, like allow them to actually be used, right? Right? Like if you're just like banging the weight around, right? Like the muscles are not going to develop as much as you'd like them to, yeah. you know? And it's even interesting if you start to really like when I was doing those squats where I was talking about earlier on the podcast, where I would go down really slow, by the way, oh, and jiu-jitsu guys should squat. They typically have like such weak legs, yeah. um, like <laughs> strengthen your damn legs. Cause right. it's important. Like, like what do all jiu-jitsu guys complain about their knees? Yeah. Right. They're, oh, my knees hurt. My knees hurt. If you strengthen the muscles and the tendons around those knees, it's going to help them. It's a good idea. Yes. Great. You need to learn how to do them properly, but strengthening and doing some squats and things like that, very, very important. You know, even like things like the medial delt, which helps stabilize the knees are very, very important. With those squats, I noticed that as I got used to squatting, I felt different muscles. Like I remember as I would get used to getting down into a deeper squat, I would feel my quads and my glutes would start to engage more, right? Whereas before it's like when I was doing a more shallow squat, it was like my hamstrings would get really tight. Mm. But as my hamstrings allowed me to get into a deeper position, I felt almost like my quads are turning on, my glutes are turning on and stuff like that. And so even getting into those deeper ranges of motion will help you if you want to just, again, recruit some more muscle and, you know, be a little bit more swole, so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> and also like, you won't get as tired in difficult positions when you're stronger. Being a newer, just a blue belt, like, you know, I find myself on the wrong end of side control pretty frequently. <laughs> mm -hmm. But having some strength in your pocket gives you, and especially when you work on your breathing, like you were talking about earlier, you have more confidence and time to come up with a plan. Mm -hmm. But when you're just really tired, maybe you've been stuck in the wrong end of a closed guard for a long time, your back is really tired. When you have all of that training behind you from strength and from just kind of focused on breathing so you don't panic, you have more time to think. Mm -hmm. You have more time to actually do jujitsu instead of just panic. <laughs> 
Yeah. As you learn the technique, you learn how to combine a little strength. The one, I think, negative thing about jujitsu, the culture of it, is that there is almost this like strength training is being strong. It's weird. Everybody wants to learn how to strength train, but then when someone's in the gym and they use a little strength, they poo-poo on it, right? It's a weird thing. It's a weird dichotomy because you see so many people, they're like, you need to start strength training. And then when you use a little strength in the gym, people gripe at you. I'm like, well, wait a second. You told the guy to do this. She's just really strong. She's not doing jujitsu. It's like... Exactly, right? That kind of uh, garbage. Um, You know, but we don't say that about flexibility. We don't say that about, man, this guy is just in really great shape. He has great cardio. He didn't use jujitsu. He just outworked me. Like, you don't say that. But strength gets poo-pooed on. But strength is just another attribute in our bodies. Because again, this is my whole big thing about jujitsu. Jujitsu technique's great, but the machine the body right because our body is a hundred percent a machine when you look at it it's it's, it's, it's amazing it's amazing yeah this biological machine that you have is the thing that is going to express these techniques and if it's in bad shape if it's been given bad fuel if it's all jacked up and out of repair don't expect anything amazing from it yeah but if you say if you get this darn thing and run in well and you treat it well and you give it the right fuel and you give it the right maintenance that it needs to run efficiently and effectively then you get to do all kinds of cool stuff and so again if you get a body that's strong and that's limber or whatever, it can do some really cool stuff on the mat. I mean, strength training is just a part of it. And, you know, I think that adding a little strength to technique is very useful. And it's one of the reasons why, if you look at all the best jujitsu competitors in the world, with very few exceptions, they're all kind of jacked. Yeah. Right. Very few of them are like frail little weaklings or anything like that. I mean, I know I don't know of any of them. Yeah. They're all in good shape for the most part, you know. They have the muscles to do the things with the bones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's a thing, you know. And so I think it's a really good idea to throw some strength training in there, whether you're doing jiu-jitsu or not. It's just a good thing for human bodies. Absolutely. I dig it. <laughs> <laughs> do you have any uh strength related goals this year? So last year, my goal was because with COVID going around, everybody started getting like wider and I wanted to get a little bit thinner. So I was like, I'm going to cut weight. So I ended up getting like pretty leaned out. I thinned out pretty well and lost about 14 pounds for a competition. Nice job. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I was very strict on my diet. I hired a, uh, more of a bodybuilding coach. I was like, all right, I'm going to, cause they know how to manipulate this thing. All right, let's do it. So I, you know, got on a diet and followed it to a T worked out great. And I never actually followed a bodybuilding plan before. So I was like, let me do it. I'm going to make some adjustments to it a bit because I don't want to do some stuff. Like I don't want to be excessive with curls or anything like that because I'm doing so much already. But let me follow some of the programming that the guy had. So I did that for a little bit, just doing some bro lifting or whatever. Bodybuilders are hard workers. Oh my gosh. They are. (laughs) And it's different because the workouts would last a while. Obviously, rest times are short. Reps are higher more sets, more volume. The one thing that I found is like, I actually was a little bit less fatigued than if I was doing like a hard strength training workout. Yeah, Like I could go in and do all these different exercises, but because everything's so like low as far as percentage weight, it wasn't too bad. You're going like pretty much everything's in like the, you know, like 60s, 70s, you know, maybe sometimes 80% range if we're really getting after it. But otherwise it's pretty low in comparison to like weight wise. But then like, if I was going to do like a hard, like a deadlifting session, deadlifting more than anything takes it out of me. Like a squat will beat me down for the day. But like deadlifting, like I feel like I'm exhausted for like a day and a half afterwards. Absolutely. That's the case. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But so as far as strength training goes right now, I'm actually trying to gain a little bit of weight. I got low for the diet. And so now I'm trying to work up, but try to improve my composition a little bit. I just want to, again, right now it's more of a, I just want to look a little bit better with my clothes off, so to speak. And I'm trying to again, be strong, but also be a little bit more limber. So like with all my exercises, I'm really focusing on the range of motion right now because I really, it's just something that seems like it's been working for me as far as how my body feels. Like my knees, for instance, have felt the best they felt in years just from doing a lot of leg work with them, but being very controlled with everything that I'm doing rather than just going nuts and doing really fast reps or anything like that. The weights dropped a bit. And then later on, after I'm done with that, I'll probably throw some strength back into it and be a little focus on being a little bit stronger. But for right now, it's more just aesthetics a bit right now. Sounds fun. I've never done a bodybuilding workout, so it's still new to me. I haven't even been on it for a year. It's most of the time been like strength training forever. Like it's always just like, we're going to put some weight, we're going to push it. So I did some strongman when I was in my early 20s oh, and rad. stuff, you know, so yeah, you've done a bunch. I enjoyed all that stuff. <laughs> you've done a lot of fun stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was fun. You know, I mean, I, granted, I wasn't great at it. I got big. I was like 250 at the time, you know. And Which is still small for a strongman. <laughs> I know, right? It was huge for me and my frame, but it's tiny for a strongman, yeah. right? But I was lifting and doing powerlifting and all this stuff and enjoyed it. And so, you know, it's just one of those things where, as of right now, I'm just trying something new. So that's a fun thing after you've been doing physical sports for a long time is 
you're like a science experiment. Mm -hmm. And the more muscle you have, it's like the more fun you can have with like manipulating diet, manipulating what kind of program you want to run and what you can do with bodybuilding stuff and strength stuff. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have all that musculature yet, you just need to lay the foundation first. But sure. That sounds like you're going to do something fun this year. Yeah. So I just having fun with it. And that's the cool thing about like being in decent shape is you can like do stuff. with Let me see what else I can do with this thing. You're obviously into lifting and then you got into jujitsu. You're like, let's see what this body that I've made stronger can do in this realm. You know, so it's just, it's fun to be able to mix it up. Yeah. Well, thanks, dude. (laughs) Absolutely. Thank you for having me on. I feel like this is really cool. You get questions asked to you all the time, but it was really awesome. That just got y'all myself there for a minute. (laughs) (laughs) What are the multiple mediums where people can find you? If you want to find me, for some reason, this conversation has sparked something in you that you're like, I'd like to hear more from this fellow. (laughs) You can go probably the best place would be YouTube, YouTube youtube.com. And then just put in chujitsu, C-H-E-W-J-I-T-S-U at Gmail. And you'll find my videos there. Such a great channel. That's probably the best place. If you're on Instagram, you can check that out as well as Chujitsu, or you can just go on Google and you can literally put in Chujitsu and just, you can go down the rabbit hole and see what I've got going on. So any of those places are fine. And if you're thinking about doing Jujitsu, I recommend it. It's a fun way to, like, if you're already a lifter, mm-hmm. it's different because we're used to the bar. It's bilateral movement. We know what to expect from the bar. But if you want to see what it's like to deal with an opponent who has arms and legs and emotions and <laughs> yeah. other stuff that they're working through. It sure is fun to explore what your strength is like in a whole nother arena. It is. It's neat to see. Yeah. And you can even think about it as cardio, right? Oh, yeah. It's the most engaging cardiovascular exercise that I could ever recommend to someone. You know, most of the time cardio, if you say you're going to do cardio when you're talking about going to a gym, it's like get on the Stairmaster or the bike, you know, and just like count down the minutes. Whereas, you know, you'll have a six, eight minute, whatever round of jiu-jitsu rolling and the time flies by because you're engaged with this other person. And so you'll literally chew through calories, you know, doing that. So if, if you're someone that's trying to add a little bit of cardio in the mix and you want to find out what your strength can do outside of the weight room, then yeah. it's a great thing to do. I love it. Yeah. I was just joking around with Matt and Andrew, who are the guys that I work with here about my heart rate and how it's just so much better than theirs. <laughs> <laughs> Like we were going for a walk and I think my heart rate was at one of their heart rates while they're sleeping. (laughs) Oh, wow. What does your heart rate drop to usually? When I sleep, I get alerts that it goes down to 39 while I'm sleeping. Okay. I'm in like typically the high to mid 40s when I'm sleeping. Nice. Yeah. Which is pretty dang good. Like, yeah, it's not bad. Our watches you worry know? that we're dying, I think. <laughs> I know, right? It's like, are you dying? No, the heart's really strong, you know? I mean, yeah. <laughs> it's weird, isn't it? Because it's not that abnormal when you talk to a lot of athletes right. and people that work out a lot where their heart rate drops like that. But because of, I think of our culture, that's an abnormal thing to be in great shape, right? To like all of a sudden your heart's dropping down to what's considered to be potentially dangerous yeah. because your heart just doesn't need to do that much work because it is so strong. Yeah, strong heart. <laughs> and if you want to do abs, I think jujitsu is the best ab exercise. <laughs> <laughs> your abs will definitely burn from it 100%, especially yeah. when you start. <laughs> Big time. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you being here and good luck with your jujitsuing and strengthening. <laughs> thank you so much. And thanks for having me on. Thank you.